everyone to Seek, Go, Create. This is where we redefine success in leadership, business, and ministry by sharing topics and conversations that allow us to rethink how we live, work, and lead. Before we get to our guests, I just want to say I'm your host, Tim Winders. I'm a performance coach and author who specializes in helping executive teams and entrepreneurial leaders maximize their potential. First thing I want you to do before we get going here, make sure that at the end of this episode that you go to seekgocreate.com. That's seekgocreate.com. At the very top there, you'll see a banner. Give us your best email address, and we'll make sure you never miss an episode, and you'll be able to continue the dialogue with us after this episode in. So today we have kind of a long time connection. We haven't spoken in a while, and I saw some things recently on social media and said, this guy has got some wisdom about what's going on in the world today. We have Chris Hearn as our guest. Chris is the founder and CEO of Fountainhead Commercial Capital and also some affiliates associated with that. It is a nationwide non-bank direct commercial lending firm that specializes in funding commercial real estate projects and providing growth financing for business owners. And I'll just go ahead and peel back one layer here they handle quite a few of the PPP loans <laughs> that we saw earlier this year at the time of recording, if you're listening in 2021 last year. Chris, welcome to Seek, Go, Create. Thank you for having me, Tim. Appreciate it. So when we first got started here, I said, how you doing? You said, man, I'm a little bit tired, man. Tell us about that. <laughs> you, you broke up on me just a little bit there, Tim. Okay, when we first got started here, uh, you mentioned that you were a little bit fatigued. Uh, tell us more about that. Yes. What's going on? Uh, well, we just, we've had, uh, like most people, we've had a pretty rough and tumble 2020. Um, maybe a little rougher than most in that, uh, yeah, we, uh, we've, we more than carried our fair share of uh, helping save the small business community. We did, um, my little team of at the time, 28 people did a little over 8,200 PPP loans. And uh, I was also very involved in the, in the political and regulatory process in the early days and even throughout most of it and still am. And, um, you know, it's just, there's a lot of stuff coming at us. And, and we've, uh, the other business is growing tremendously where we, we do a lot of business acquisition financing and uh, partner buyouts and working capital and debt refi and all sorts of things. And uh, it's just, it's a lot. I um, I used to joke that I need to find out the formula to clone myself, and uh, now I'm I'm pretty desperately seeking that formula because uh, I, I definitely could use it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, we're, we'll hopefully stay engaged. I can tell you have a little sure. fatigue in your voice, but I know you've got a lot <laughs> going on. You're you're a high energy guy. Before my first question, I usually like to ask is kind of what's your elevator pitch? What do you do if someone that doesn't know anything about the industry, maybe even not in the small business space, right. ask you, what do you do? What do you tell them, Chris? Uh, I tell them that we're, uh, we're lenders to the small business community. And what that means is the small business community is about 47% of the U.S. economy. And uh, we're, we're vital providers of, of financing. We, uh, as, I, as I just was mentioning, we, we finance commercial real estate we finance for business owners and entrepreneurs. We finance business acquisitions, working capital, uh, partner buyouts, debt refinance, consolidation, uh, and so forth. And um, we're, we're different than most of our competitors in that we are not a depository institution like a bank or a credit union. We're actually one of only 14 non-banks that are licensed by the U.S. government to do the programs that we do. And... Um, you know, I like to say that we're entrepreneurs like the people that we finance. And so uh, I'm, I'm the guy who, uh, who's been signing the front of checks for a long time. And uh, I know what that's like. And uh, I know the, the trials and tribulations that business owners and entrepreneurs go through. And, um, you know, they're my people. And, that's, and I like to try and help them out. And, and it's, uh, that's part of the reason why it's been a challenging year, because there's been a lot of people that really have needed a lot of help. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's a little bit longer than an elevator pitch, Tim, but I want to expand it a little bit. No, that's, that's really good because it, it kind of, and see, one of the things I kind of bounced with, I kind of made some notes and did some research and had some thoughts. And one of the things, well, let's do this first, Chris. 
I want to okay. glean some wisdom from you on what all you've learned this last year, what you can share. We've got a lot of business owners. We've got a lot of business owners that are listeners. We actually have some business sure. owners outside the U.S. too. So they, you know, they may learn some things. They may get some insight into how we do things here. But I kind of would love for you to just give a brief how you ended up in this industry. I think you and I first connected like 12, 14 years ago in and around right. the Dan Kennedy world. And yep. I don't yep. really know your background prior to that. So give us a little background and then we will get to kind of your year, the timeline of 2020. <laughs> That's fine. So uh, I like to say that I've, I've sort of been an entrepreneur since about age eight. Um, when I was growing up in the Midwest, I live in Florida now, I've been down here for about 23 years. But when I was growing up in the Midwest, you know, um, you do a lot of lawn maintenance, let's call it, which is, uh, you know, you're cutting grass in the spring and summer, you're, you're raking leaves in the fall and you're shoveling snow in the winter. And uh, I did a lot of that. I did, I had a lot of jobs. I've, I've worked since I was eight, pretty much straight. And um, my mother was an entrepreneur. She believed it or not, she was a chocolate maker, um, which, which sounds uh, better than it is, but you get, you, <laughs> like everything, you get tired of it after a while. And, and um, you know, if you, if you're really enmeshed in it and you'll, uh, Eventually, later on in life, you get you become a bit of a snob about about what chocolate, is, you know, and and of course I helped her with that as well, and and learned a lot in in sales and that process in that aspect. But um, I, uh, I I went to I went to college, went to grad school, and um, at the time there was a recession, and and believe it or not, it was a bit humbling. But I started as a uh, as a temp, as a temporary worker, and uh, I was by far the best temp I think they ever had. And within about two months, they they hired me full time as soon as they could out of the contract. And uh, from there, um, I just took off and and uh, had done very well in, in sales and marketing. After a couple of years, uh, some recruiters came calling, and um, the, where I ended up was uh, was at GE Capital, which at the time was the largest non bank lender in the world. And um, they actually, after about six months, I used to live outside of Washington, D.C. area after I went to grad school in, in Philadelphia. And uh, they, they offered to move my wife and I to, um, to Denver, Charlotte, or Orlando. And uh, as an enlightened Midwesterner, I've always wanted to get back to the, uh, to the sunshine and the climate. And so it was a pretty easy choice. So we, we moved to Orlando. That was a little over 23 years ago. And um, I did that for a few years and, and I got recruited to another company that GE bought, uh, which I always used to joke if they just would have uh, got rid of sort of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ceiling on compensation because uh, that's what they used to do back in the day. I would have, I would have gladly stayed, but um, they got me back and then I left again. I was a management consultant for a couple of years and, uh, and was out of the finance world. And um, then I decided to start my own business and it was, uh, it was sort of in the aftermath of, 9-11 that I did that and uh, launched my first company, which was a, which was my own non-bank uh, lender um, in 2002. And I sold in 2010 to a bank and stuck around for almost four years. At the end, I tried to buy it back and uh, they kind of, you know, messed around with me a little bit. They were actually buying them, they were selling themselves to a larger bank at the time. So it was a little bit of a wasted couple months, but um, I, I feel like I got the best of that because uh, I left and uh, I actually started my current company, Fountainhead, about six months later, uh, about 30 days before they finished the deal and selling themselves to the bigger bank. And uh, the rest is history. We've been, uh, this is my second company that I've had on the Inc. 500 list. Um, we've been uh, just scaling tremendously. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. Um, we just got uh, named the best places to work in Orlando for the second time. Um, so it's just, uh, just a lot of stuff that's, that's going on. And it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's just fun. I'd, I'd much prefer to be busy and dealing with a lot of the, uh, the plate spinning that I do than, uh, than have the opposite. So that's a, that's a quick summary of, of my background yeah. and how we got here, Tim. Yeah. And that's good. And I, I like to ask a couple of things to kind of, I think it kind of preps us for heading into times like we're in right now. And Chris, one thing I'm curious about, it might be a couple things we'll see here where, I, where mm -hmm. I go with this, but I'm curious if we were to jump back to 20 year old you and describe where you are now, what would 20 year old you say about it? Would it, would he be shocked? Would he be like, Oh yeah, that I'm going to, I'm going to do well. I'm going to be successful. Or what, what do you think? You ever, think about that because I, I think it says a lot about us to kind of have some time, you know, some of those thoughts. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I haven't really thought about it too much, but I think uh, in putting myself backwards, uh, um, 
Yeah, I don't think I ever questioned that I'd be a success, Tim. I don't think that was it at all. Um, I don't think I would have ever guessed that I would be doing what I'm doing today, perhaps. Uh, I think I always believed that I would be my own boss and, and sort of control my destiny. I, that's just how my personality's wired up. Um, so that doesn't shock me. Uh, 20-year-old Chris was, uh, was, was very into uh, the political process, which, you know, actually 48-year-old Chris has, has done a lot of that too, particularly this year. Um, but not quite what 20 year old Chris, Chris thought, um, you know, it's kind of that old adage that, you know, if you're not, uh, if you're, if you're not, uh, what is the expression? If you're not liberal in your twenties, you have no heart. And if you're not conservative in your, in your forties, you have no brain. I, I think there's an aspect of that. I don't want to get overly political with anybody, but, um, you know, I, I, I've been through that. I've been, I've been on both sides and, uh, and I, and I see how the process works and, it is an extraordinarily infuriating process. I will tell you that, Tim. Um, so I don't think that the 20 year old Chris had a, had a clue what it was going to be like in, uh, you know, almost 30 years later. But um, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that in my mind that I, I would, I would be successful. So I agree. I don't want to get super polarizing here, but so it sounds as if you have been around, we'll call it both parties. Is that correct? Have, and can I, I assume that? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. That That is interesting. So I, I don't know that, I, I guess that kind of maybe surprises me a little bit, but I have heard that, that <laughs> as people gain, and you, you made a comment, listen, as we're recording this, the election in the U.S. has not occurred. When the podcast right. releases, it most likely will. So we're not sure when the listener is going to be listening, you know, so we don't know the results or anything like that, but I'm kind of the same as you. I, I had political right. aspirations early on. And I can't say that I've moved around, but I have shifted some of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this might be a good time to kind of go into it a little bit. What, what are you seeing? And, and I know you're an advocate for small business people. So maybe mm -hmm. we'll kind of put that as the, as the framework. Sure. What do you, and I know you're around Washington a good bit. So what are you seeing that, that gives you hope? And what are you seeing that concerns you? with that arena is that is that a fair question yeah no that's fine no it, this is all fair questions tim um what what gives me hope i think um and this, and this is i don't mean any offense to the non-american listeners but i do think that we have a spirit in this country that is um it, it's just uh you shouldn't bet against americans and even in tough times like we've had in 2020, we're, we're a very aspirational people. Um, we, uh, you know, the best of us don't, we might get down sometimes, but we don't stay down. And I think that's important. Um, I also think that we're a, we're, a, we're a symbol and an example to people around the world. That's why um, so many people want to come here. And, um, and, and I, by the way, that, that, that um, you know, puts a, it certainly puts a bullseye on us, but it also is a, is a bit of an honor. And, and I think um, those of us who view it that way take that very seriously and, uh, and try to comport themselves accordingly. Um, but I think, you know, I, I do believe that we're going to get through all this. Um, you know, and when I say by this, I mean, you know, the, co the coronavirus, the fallout from that, the shutdowns, the, you know, the hysterics, the, you know, the panics, um, you know, just all the all the economic consequences of these things i i'm positive we're going to get through it the question is just how long it's going to take and um you know i am i am deeply concerned with uh, how much printing of money we're doing uh, as a as a as a world right now it's not just in america but all over the place uh, because somebody is going to have to pay this back um it'll probably be our our grandkids grandkids but um you know, it's, uh, I guess, so, so that's, so that's what I'm excited about, because I, I do think this spirit that we have, and it's really, and it's, you know, candidly, it's universal in terms of the, just the entrepreneurial spirit, just to take, take on problems head on and try to, try to solve them. Um, that's something that we've, we've, we've been doing as a people for 240 plus years. But um, what am I concerned about? I think that was the other question, where we're yeah. going. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, as you said earlier, having been on both sides of the aisle uh, over the years, and actually even what I do right now is very bipartisan in, in, in most respects. Not too many uh, politicians want to be against the small business owner um, because it is 47% of the economy. And, but, but I think um, we got to get back to a place um, as a civilization where you can agree to disagree. 
and you can move on and you can be friends. And, um, and it, and it's, and it's on both extremes. And that's what I find very concerning. It's, uh, you know, I, and, and, I'm not sure who started it <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm probably guilty of some of this myself in that, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've, I've unfriended some people on social media cause I just, I just can't take it anymore. I'm just like, you gotta stop. And, and this is nuts and this isn't why we're friends. Um, but we've got to get to a place where we can, we can have these conversations in the appropriate time. And if it's, if people are going to be, very sensitive, then, then let's set it aside. You know, when I was a kid, I remember people, people didn't talk much. I think there was the expression, people didn't talk, talk much about, you know, religion and politics. Those are the two big things that you want to kind of keep out of the, uh, out of the dining room table, so to speak. And um, I think there's some truth to that. And it doesn't mean you can't talk about it. I mean, my God, everybody's very transparent these days with, with the prevalence of social media and everything else. But, um, but you can't take it personally. And you got to be okay with the fact that there may be some people that disagree with you fundamentally. And um, that doesn't make them a bad person. Um, it doesn't mean they're not going to heaven or <laughs> whatever you believe in, but, but we've got to be more civil to one another because when we are most civil with one another, that's when we can make the most progress for everybody. And, uh, and that's really, at the end of the day, that's, that's probably what I'm about the most, which is prosperity. I think prosperity cures most of what ails us. And, um, you know, if you're anti-prosperity, I mean, that's, that's a problem. But uh, I think, I think entrepreneurialism has created, um, you know, raised the standard of living for more people than, than any bureaucrat or politician has ever done, um, barring maybe a few world wars, and we've saved, saved some people. But I, I think that is, that's the spirit that I like, and that's what I want to see more of. And uh, I'm actually, you know, um, pretty buoyed up, Tim, that uh, during this downturn, the, uh, the, the number of businesses that have started up actually is, is dramatically rising. It's, it's way up, um, which kind of defies maybe some uh, reason a little bit, but uh, it had been down for, for about the last decade. So I think that's a, that's a positive. So, um, you know, today's little, little acorns are going to be tomorrow's oak trees uh, in business. And I think that's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, that is good. You know, I, I've put some thought into it also because I have to watch myself getting drug into conversations and, yes. and, you know, I actually am sort of checking out of some of the back and forth might be a way of saying it. Yeah. And Chris, it's interesting. I, I put thought into it. I think I'm older than you, probably about 10 years older than you. And to me, it seems as if there are two things that are fueling it and they go back almost 30 years. The first thing is the 24 seven news cycle and then the second thing is what you brought up, which is social media. I think those two things right. make it to where you and I, when we're sitting here, I mean, we're Zoom now and we're recording, we're still looking in each other's faces and it's, right. you know, we kind of want to be civil. I'm not going to call you certain things, hopefully, and you're not going to call me. Let's <laughs> right. hope it doesn't come to that. Right. But, no, uh, no, I don't think so. but anyway, yeah, yeah. But if we're on social media, there's not a face there. There's not a person. We can spout things. And anyway, I, I, I do... I'm hopeful that some of that changes. I do want to ask though, because you mentioned 9-11 and you mentioned, you know, when you started working, there was a recession going on and, and mm -hmm. kind of at a high level before we really start talking about some of the details of 2020 and all that you've seen with your business and, and businesses, can you compare mm -hmm. the time we're in now from your perspective? I know that listen, I don't know who experts would be in today's world, you know, because no one can see everything, but from your seat, right. from where you sit, can you compare what, what we saw at, you know, nine 11, what all went on there, maybe 2008. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have recollection of a downturn prior to that with what we're seeing now and just give some perspective for all of us from, from where you sit. Well, I, I think it's, um, it's an interesting question. And I think, I think, I think, uh, I feel like the mood of people is, is much more pessimistic right now, but it's, but there's a confused pessimism. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're, we're, we're battling an enemy that we can't see and we don't really know how somebody gets the virus and we've chosen to shut down the economy, the world's economy for the most part, or a big chunk of it. And we're only now starting to reopen things. Um, and I think, you know, I know that we've both seen 
reports about what this is doing to people's mental health, for instance, and, you know, what did, you know, the, the percentage increases of addictions and, um, you know, violence against, uh, you know, spouses and children, for instance, and just there's, there's all these ramifications that come from it when people don't have um, some semblance of routine and order and purpose. Um, and a lot of people haven't had purpose. I mean, I think that's, uh, I think that's part of our problem as a society is um, too many people think that, you know, their job defines them, for instance. And, um, and obviously, we're much more complicated than that. A lot more nuances to us. Um, but, but I think, yeah, I think there's a pessimism. I think it's worse. Economically, it's clearly, and, and statistically, if you look at the numbers and, and whatnot, it's, it's definitely worse than the last recession, the so-called Great Recession. Um, it's, it's definitely worse than, than uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, and from a, from, a, um, from a mood standpoint, I guess. Um, but I, I also think... Um, you know, there's, there's this kind of sly optimism that I think a lot of people have because they, they, you know, there's still some just stuff doesn't fit together very nicely and neatly. You know, it's just like, you know, are the masks really going to help us? I don't know. These plexiglass that are between the, the desks. I mean, that seems, you know, if it's all airborne, then what, what's the point? And if it can stay airborne for hours and what, what are we doing? Maybe we should have just taken the most vulnerable folks and, and tried to quarantine them and, and not literally shut down the world's largest economy um, in a matter of a couple months. And um, so I think there's, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's, it's, it's strange. It's a very paradoxical time. And I think that's really weighing heavily on people's minds and their hearts. Um, and it's, so it's just, I don't think, none of us have ever experienced anything remotely close to this. That's why I said, I think it's so much worse than the last recession economically. It's worse from a mood standpoint than 9-11. Than, than um, I kind of, I mean, I've, I've been on some news media and, and I've been asked this question and I, and I said, it's kind of like both of those things wrapped up together, plus the protests after Vietnam, maybe, I, I don't know, there's aspects of, you know, World War II perhaps in this, although I, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle that in any way, but, um, you know, I don't know that, I don't know that we're, we're on the cusp of the end of civilization, for instance, but, but there has, there are some aspects of that. that it kind of feels that way, you know, and, and, um, I don't know. It's it's a it's just a very troubling time, you know. It's just uh, it's very strange, very strange it, times. It is. Would you would you say? You know, I'm sure you're familiar with the term a black swan event, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, you know, you and I are you know we've got a few years under our belts, so we've seen some things and and you know like to think you know we we have control over situations, and then something like this happens. To me, it seems like this could be an event for a generation that kind of defines a lot of things. Do you agree with that? Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, this is, this is the, the biggest blackest swan that there will probably, uh, hopefully God willing will exist in our lives. Um, right. And, and I feel I have an eight, uh, 19 year old daughter who just started college um, hmm. at Baylor in, in Texas. And um, you know, uh, it's funny, you look at, you look at her lifetime, and, and it just, it only occurred to me a few months ago. I mean, she was born 11 days before 9-11, and there's a whole story there that we, we could go in if you want. Um, then when she's sort of coming of age, not, you know, kind of at the end of adolescence, you know, preteen, so to speak, then you've got the Great Recession, and now you've got the coronavirus pandemic uh, as, she's, as she's a senior in high school and now going off to college. I mean, these kids can't get a break, Tim. I mean, that's just that that particular age group is just like it's staggering. Those kids that were born in two thousand one, two thousand two, it's just uh, it's rough. It's rough. So yeah, I think it's going to define them. I mean, you know, we've got what generation? We got baby boomers. We got Generation X. We got you know millennials. I, I, somebody's going to come up with a name for these poor kids. It's. Uh, yeah, and who knows? Who knows? Yeah, the, the, pan, the, pan, the pandemic generation. I don't know. It's going to be. It's going to be kind of tough and all. So, well, I appreciate you sharing all that because I, I really have put some thought into that myself, and I've actually noticed. I mean, I've got clients that have done very well during this time, mm -hmm. and I've got some clients that have been beaten to a pulp, and 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 so it kind of caused me to reel. Plus you know, from my spiritual foundation as a follower of Christ, at times I'm going, 
what is going on? I mean, you know, I'll just sit and go, what is going on, Lord? And I know different people have different spiritual beliefs that actually listen in, but it's kind of like something is happening. And I just don't think we can grasp all that, all that's going on. But uh, let me back up a little bit and tell me through all this, let's kind of talk a little bit about personal things. How has family done? And I'm going to ask you some questions about Orlando because I was in Orlando March uh, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th at a conference with 1,800 people from all over the world. And I think it was Monday the 9th. I can't remember the exact date, but I went to Disney Right. And and went to the Star Wars, you know, uh, Galaxy Galaxy's End thing, and right. and then got on a plane that was half full or half empty, depending on how you look at it. Flew back to Denver, and then the world shut down a few days later. And I've and I've often thought about how cities like Orlando deal with this. And I know you're prominent and you you do a lot in the city in that area. But mm-hmm. talk to me about two things. Talk tell us about number one, your family, how your kids are doing, all of that, because there's a lot that's happening here personally and in business. And I know you're yep. juggling all that and then just kind of keep going right into the city that everyone goes to, to go to amusement parks that they can't right now. Can you share all that right. with us? Sure. Sure. Oh, let me just back up for a second because um, you, you were saying a minute ago, I, I think, I think I, I always view things like what we're going through as, as a bit of a challenge as a test. And I, I, I do think, we are given things um, to determine what we're capable of handling. And, and even if you've had a successful 2020, and it, we're a great example. I mean, we're, our business is up, we're 6X this year at least. I mean, it's crazy. I, I couldn't even have dreamt uh, what we've done so far this year. But that's taken, that takes a lot of out of you as well. Um, it's not, you know, hasn't been a nice, neat, you know, up and to the right type of a, type of a growth. It's been, it's been, you know, I don't know what's higher than a hockey stick, maybe a totem pole straight up or something. But um, so that's why I think um, if we're being honest, I mean, I think everybody's been challenged and I think everybody's a little fatigued by 2020. We're ready for 2021. Um, In terms of my family, um, my, uh, I have a son who's a teenager, who's 17, who is a junior in high school. And again, same thing. It's, um, you know, it's tough right now for the kids because of uh, virtual learning and what they have to go through. And uh, I was talking to my son the other day and, he, you know, he said, um, you know, with the, the plexiglass glass on the desks and everybody's wearing masks in class, even when the teacher asks a question, the teacher's not really sure who's answering. So now they have like a special code where they're, you know, raising a hand or somebody's pointing to so-and-so answer because the teachers can't tell they can't can't read you know can't see the face uh, with the masks on it's just it, it's it's less than optimal obviously that's not quite how uh, how the educational system probably should work although it's it's certainly challenging you know is is this what we should be doing you know I've long believed that the education system we have does not very adequately prepare people for the real world. You know, there's there's far too much emphasis on, on rote memorization and, and not enough on critical thinking and, um, you know, learning things that really you'll have to confront in the work world. Um, and I know this because I've probably had now about 140 interns work for me over the last, um, you know, 18 years, 18, 20 years. And, uh, it doesn't matter what school they go to. I, I have to like sort of deprogram these kids and like teach them how to communicate and what's appropriate, not appropriate by, you know, by email, by phone, et cetera. Um, what's important, you know, a lot of these, I just don't think they're, a lot of these kids are gaining much from, um, from the secondary education or higher education in many ways. And it's, and it's frustrating. And in some ways, some of this is, um, you know, I liken it to, a, it's a bit of a finishing school, you know, yeah, maybe we don't want to send our 18, 19 year olds straight out into the workforce. So we're going to give them four or five years to sort of, you know, learn things before they go out. I, I don't know. I just, I don't know that that's, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I think, I think um, there's a lot of things that we're being forced to confront and rethink and, and try to determine if it's, if it's right or wrong. Um, you know, my son spends most days, um, you know, I used to think he was, uh, he was really into his video games and his, uh, you know, Discord and all the other stuff that they do, you know, online before this, but man, during this, and at some point as a parent, it's tough to 
continue to resist. I was that guy, that <laughs> dad who for years said you get, you know, two hours of video games a week. Well, that was, you know, that was like, you would have thought I was some dictator or something. And eventually, you know, it's, it's eventually they, they chip away and eventually it, it becomes now it's, now, you know, it's two hours a day. And, and really during the pandemic, while you're not at school, maybe it's four hours a day or whatever. I just, I don't know how, I don't know how I feel about that. Cause I just don't know how healthy some of that is. Um, you know, it's, I always liken it. I'm not a video game guy, but I just liken it to, it's, it's a bit of mind candy and it's not some of the stuff fortunately my son does is he's interacting with other people and there is some aspects of, of, of strategy and other things. So maybe that's okay, but I, I just, I, I'm very, very suspicious about that sort of thing. Um, my wife and I, my wife's been tremendously supportive, um, during this whole, uh, uh, you know, crisis that we've been through and, and there for, um, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into this in a little bit, but, you know, I probably went a good five months averaging about 16 hour days, um, seven days a week, which is not healthy um, and, and not good. But I also felt like it was uh, somewhat my obligation to try and to try and help out. And not a lot of people have the expertise that I do or were in a position to have impacted people like I could. So um, I, I felt like it was a bit of a, of a duty um, that, that we had to do. And, and, uh, and that kept me going, but I can tell you, there were some nights where I'd, I'd stumble in at, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night during mm-hmm. the work week. And, um, yeah, so I, I, I give a lot of kudos to my wife and helping me with that. Um, you know, I think we're in a, we're in a pretty good place. Um, we are, uh, I think it's probably crazy. We decided, um, much like I learned when we were getting on this, you're, you're broadcasting from the RV. We decided that we were, uh, now is probably a good time to downsize because it's just the three of us, my wife, my, my son, and myself. And so, uh, well, I say downsize, but I, I, get a, I get some grief from some buddies of mine who um, they know that I, I, I've always wanted to live on water here in Florida. And uh, I, bought, I bought some land on a lake in Winter Park westward facing which takes a lot to find land that you can build on uh, that's westward facing because i'm a sunset type of a guy not a sunrise and so we're going to construct a house and and unfortunately unfortunately it's probably gonna be about the same size as our house now which is too big but i think it's about uh, you know design and layout and it's something that i've always wanted to do i i finance a lot of construction a commercial construction already so I, I i you know and in another life i probably would have been an architect i really enjoy that so i'm looking forward to that but we we up and decided you know with with um, residential interest rates at all-time lows and uh you know inventory at, at very very lows um and we've been in the same house now for about 17 years which is a great you know gated golf course community we decided now's a great time for us to list the list the house, and we just did it earlier this week, actually, um, and we're we're moving into an apartment. I haven't been in an apartment in about twenty six years, I think. Um, it's which is I'm actually kind of looking forward to it because I I view it as kind of decluttering and and sort of simplifying my life a little bit, and and I think this will be a good thing for us to get rid of some of the crap that we still have from like the last couple moves, you know, that are still in boxes. So we're purging all that. We're going to downsize a little bit. We'll move into the apartment. Um, it is a well laid out apartment. I, I got to tell you, but I only need like four rooms, probably like you, Tim. I mean, I just, you know, it's the, it's the bathroom, the, the family room and the bedroom. And that's pretty much all I need. Um, it's my wife and son that maybe need more, but um, so I'm looking forward to it. And then, and then probably about two years from now, we'll, we'll be moving into our, our lake house. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And I feel like we can start fresh at that time. So uh so that's something that we've been going through. Um, in terms of that, Orlando, that, I think that was your last. You're bit, well, you're a bit ahead. of a, ma- a masochist to kind of be doing all of that in the midst <laughs> yeah. of it. Come on, Chris. It's like. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, it, let, trust me, that's going through my head. Like, what am I doing? This is, let me, this is let me, maximal stress you could handle, you know? Before we real quick get to Orlando, let me tell you, we actually went through like in 08, we, we went through some business challenges. And so we went through a downsizing that was somewhat forced on us. But I will say this. When you purge and get rid of stuff, it is one of the most liberating things that I have ever done. And I mean, now we live really lean. Most everything we have is behind me here in in the RV. We've got a little storage unit. And you know what? I wear a few black shirts. I've got a room. My wife's got her office in the back. And 
I'm telling you, you know, now we're total empty nesters, so it works out best, but, but uh, anyway, yeah, you're going to have fun with that. So we'll keep up with you and see how, how things are going there. And, and, well, that's what we're trying to do is we, we want to build our, uh, you know, our little empty nest uh, castle. But in the meantime, yeah, it's, I mean, I can remember my wife a few weeks back, she's like, um, can I now throw away the cassette tapes? Cause we have nothing in the house that can play these things. I'm like, yeah, you probably could throw away the CDs and the DVDs. Cause I don't think we have anything that plays that stuff either. So, I mean, yeah, we just have, we have, and I keep telling her every time you go to Goodwill or, or uh, Salvation Army, just make sure you have my receipts. Cause this is going to be a big year for, for write-offs. Yeah, um, but, it'll be huge. All right, well, let's move on. All right. So just give us a few, like, Orlando, the place that is amusement park central and all, yep. all that goes on with the economy. And I know, listen, that there's a lot of business that goes on around mm-hmm. that entertainment world, but that whole world's been shut down now and really Disney right. open, but not really. I don't really, I mean, people wearing masks and 20 something percent capacity and all that. So just right. in general, educate everybody that's listening, what's happening in the city of Orlando? How are they doing? Okay. So I am, um, I'm probably a case study of moving to Orlando. So I, I can remember, I I grew up outside of Peoria, Illinois, kind of a working class uh, neighborhood. Um, We went on two vacations when I was a kid. And one of them was to come to Orlando. I think I was eight. The other one was actually out your way to Denver, to Colorado. I think when I was 10 and we drove both times. We didn't, we didn't fly. And uh, I just was mesmerized by, uh, by coming here. I love, I love the climate, the sunshine, the beaches, the, uh, which is a little ways away. I mean, we're about 40 minutes from the beach. Um, you know, the theme parks, just, you know, the happiest place on earth is what they call Orlando, right? And so when I had that opportunity to move here later in life, I, I really seized it. And um, it's a, Orlando, I will tell you, it's a real city at this point, okay? Yes, the theme parks kind of built Orlando about 50 years ago is when, is when Disney World opened. Um, but you know, this is a real town now. It's grown tremendously. I think it had about 50, 60,000 people back when Disney World opened, and now we're pushing 3 million people. So a tremendous growth in a relatively short period of time. And it's rare to find somebody who's from here, okay? So it's, it's, it's truly the quintessential melting pot, and everybody's from all over. And what that, ha- what that causes is it's a, it's a very welcoming environment. It's one thing to be, you know, so prominent in the tourism and hospitality uh, business in general, and that, that's, you know, vacations and, and you know, the service industry and, and all those things that people are going to be extra nice and courteous and conscientious and everything else. But the rest of Orlando, the place where I live, you know, northeast side of town, um, you still have that kind of threading through the business community. And um, it's just it's just a very open, hospitable place, very welcoming. Um, it is it is kind of sad to see what's gone on, but you know this is the most visited place on earth, and uh, I do expect it to come back. Um, you know we might be wearing face shields uh, in the future or, or masks all the time. I don't know, but um, it is going to come back. We, we've had we've seen some massive you know unemployment here. Um, again, not so much in my world, but but certainly in the hospitality sector and the service industry, it's it's been pretty devastating. Um, we have though in in Florida now, um, we've we're, we're basically opened back up fully at this point. Like even restaurants, you, you're at 100% capacity now. Um, but you know there was months earlier this spring where it was down to 25% for quite some time. It's it's back. Um, you know that's kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where I think there's like this this sly optimism of well, what are we what are we doing and we just want to kind of get back, back to normal again um, one of the side benefits of of all of this has been as you've probably seen tim there's there's not as many commuters on the roads you know the traffic is not nearly as bad as it once was and of course we started a project here um i guess it was about three years ago to uh to fix I-4, which is the main thoroughfare that kind of crosses the state from east to west, and it's been a disaster for years, and they've been expanding the roadways and, and, and uh, sort of rationalizing the on-ramps and off-ramps and things like that, and they got behind, which is not uncommon for construction, particularly you know public sector construction, but um, over the last six to eight months, they, I think they've caught up. Um, because there just hasn't been as much of the of the delays, and it's really an amazing engineering feat. I, I don't know if anybody likes that sort of thing like I do, but it just I just find it fascinating to see how quickly 
they are um, really reforming the transportation stuff here in Orlando. And it's, 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 and I don't think it, it wouldn't have been able to be done had it been business as normal for the last eight months. So that, I think that's one of those, you know, positive things that's come out of some of this, but, yeah, and, and, um, and, but I'm positive. And, I, th- I think we're going to get back. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, there's people love coming here. We got, we have a lot of really tremendous landmark things to, to see and do here. And, um, you just people just have to have the confidence again to travel, you know. It, but it is a, it is an innate human um, behavior to want to explore, um, to be curious, to be entertained, uh, to take some time off and vacation. So I, I don't. That's not going to change. It's just a function of when it's going to start coming back. Yeah, I believe I've got I've got clients in the vacation industry. And they are in Florida, they're up in the panhandle and very similar Mm -hmm. to you. They had these shutdown time, very similar to what we were saying, but because their drive, their driving distance from a lot of places in the country, they've actually, we have surpassed some numbers. Now we still have, you know, three months, two and a half months that we had zero (laughs) revenue. So, uh, you know, but we may be at roughly 2019 numbers by the end of the year because people are still traveling because they're virtual schooling in Atlanta. And so people can go do it at the beach, but all right. So that kind of, that kind of brings us to really when I saw on social media, some of the things you were posting, I said, wow, I wonder if Chris would be willing to come on and talk because you know, in, in March, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to, I want to go timeline here because I like to, I like to kind of walk through some of this, you know, in March, you know, I was down there, I flew back, I think it was Friday the 13th or the 12th that uh, the president gets up and says, mm-hmm. we need to lock down. So tell me what was going on with you and your business kind of pre, and maybe just give it, you know, a quick glimpse of pre, uh, I don't know, early March, y'all weren't getting any indications of things. We, we were watching it, but I don't know that I was thinking anything until I came back from Orlando. When, when were you aware that something was going on? So my last trip was in early March out to San Diego. And um, I actually had a conference, a big international conference I was attending that got called off. And I had friends that were flying in from the Middle East and from Asia and Europe. And many of them got to San Diego only to realize they had to turn around and go home. And um, but I will tell you, we were off to the best year we've ever had in January, February. I mean, it was, it was tremendous. And I know exactly the Thursday night you're talking about. I think it was either the March 12th or 13th, because that was the evening that the president got on TV from the Oval Office. And he said something that will probably, you know, I, was, I told my wife later that night, I said, this is probably going to be a seminal moment in my life, which is, um, he said that evening, that the U.S. Small Business Administration, the SBA, is going to um, provide up to $50 billion of support to the small business community. Well, I don't think I've ever heard a president say anything about the SBA much, and and I've been doing this for two decades, um, let alone that dollar amount, because that dollar amount represents, that's about three-fourths of of the best year SBA's ever done, which is about 30 billion, okay? But, but here's where it gets crazy. So I, I watching, I'm watching that and a good buddy of mine, one of my best friends is, is sort of the small business media authority. And he's calling me in the middle of this and I'm having to pause it and talk to him and all. And he's like, did you just hear what he said? I said, yeah, I know. I, my, my jaw hit the ground. I said, I guess we're going to be busy for a while. And he said, yeah. And, um, and then my mind just kind of went into overdrive and I started thinking about, What's got to happen? What are they going to do? I mean, there's a lot of logistics that go into this. And I also said, you know what? It's time for me to get extra involved again in the, in the political and regulatory process. And so here in Florida, our senator, uh, one of our senators is Marco Rubio, who, who is actually the chair of the, U, of the Senate Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. And uh, he quickly became the Small Business Task Force Chair, and I've known him, and I've known a lot of the staff, and I've testified before the, 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 um, the committee a few times, and so um, I started reaching out, started talking to them, and trying to give them real-world perspective, frontline perspective of what we can do and how we can do it, and uh, by the following week, that number went up to $200 billion. Uh, the Later that week, it went to 250 and um, 
trying to remember, I think when all was said and done, it took about nine days from start to finish for the U.S. Congress to pass the biggest piece of legislation of all time, which was the CARES Act. And um, I, I'm trying to remember, I think it was like $3, bill, $3 trillion. But the piece that related to this brand new program called the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, it was going to be booted or sort of strapped onto the existing SBA 7A program, which is one of the things I do. Um, and it was going to be 330 billion dollars. Well, if we fast forward a few months, it ultimately became, it was authorized for 620 billion, I think. I, I, the numbers might be a little off here. I mean, what's a few, you know, hundred Yeah, it's just zeros. Too. It's just zeros yeah. and doubles, right? Come on. <laughs> right. But ultimately, it was over half a trillion dollars that was, that was deployed through that program, um, utilizing private sector lenders like myself. There's only about 11,000 lenders in the U.S., between banks, credit unions, and there's a couple hundred non-bank lenders like us. Uh, ironically enough, there's only 14 that are licensed by the U.S. government, like I am, uh, to do this. And that was a whole arduous process. It took a couple of years to get approved for the for to purchase one of these licenses. That they haven't they haven't issued new ones since the early 80s. So it's a it's a very um, sought after thing. Uh, so we were automatically uh, grandfathered in to participate in this program, and we basically, in that two-week period, Tim, we we pivoted the entire business to focus on this. Um, as my wife would tell you, she said, I was like a man on fire. I knew that this was our purpose and that this is what we needed to do. And that I, I said this to my staff many times, this is our moment. This is our time. This is what we were born for, really. Um, and so, uh, but that was just the beginning of it. I mean, uh, after the, piece of the, the CARES Act was passed in nine days, uh, then you got to start with a regulatory process. And so, um, you know, the first time you get a phone call from the White House, it's a little disconcerting. And, um, but by about the fourth or fifth time, it's like, okay, guys, you're not listening to me. Let me tell you again what we need to do. Uh, same thing with Treasury, same thing with SBA. I mean, I, I've, I've, I think maybe at this point they understand I can, I can be a little direct and blunt and, um, you know, I think they're used to people being politically correct all the time. And, I'm in the private sector. I'm not always politically correct. I, I, I will tell them what I, what I think and believe and feel and, and, and uh, what I think is the best thing. And I don't think they get straight shooters dealing with them very often. So that was an interesting process. Um, right. Well, let me ask, and and, let me, and let I me, had to connect the dots. I mean, yeah, there's a whole other thing we can talk about, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me pause. I want to pause you one second because there's, I've got two tracks here that my okay. mind is wanting to ask about. One is you're the head of an organization that has to pivot. Mm -hmm. And, and I know we've got leaders and, and business owners right now going, gosh, what would it be like to do that pivot? Not a total mm -hmm. pivot. It's still in your, you know, in your range of what you do. Sure. But it's also at the same time that we're being told that there's a, a disease that's going around that's literally killing right. people and we don't know much about it. So you've got right. the, the emotional management and also the practical management. So I'd love for you to mention that. And then also you've got this piece that you're talking about, which is the political piece of it. Mm -hmm. That is, and, and listen, I had clients kind of going through some of this also, and you know, our business was looking at them. It's kind of like the way they threw it out there. Every business, it was almost, uh, it was almost our duty to look at it. Should we apply? You hate to say that it kind of right. goes against some of my political beliefs, but it's mm -hmm. like everybody was, and the information seemed to be changing minute by minute. Oh, so, so yeah. tell us about that. And then I, I don't want to forget though, to ask about running the actual business during this time right. frame. So tell us about the, the constant changing of information. Well, it's brutal. I mean, it's, it was, it was farcical. I mean, uh, there's now as of, as of last night, there is, well, two, two things, which is odd. Um, the the government is is um, rolling this program out and regulating it by frequently asked questions on the one hand, which is unusual, okay, to say the least. And as of last night, they just rolled out their fifty second frequently asked question. Um, on the other side, they're also regulating it by what are called uh, interim final rules. So that's, that's more of your standard thing that would be in the Federal Registry. Um, but we've had, um, we had 28 versions of that, plus the 52 FAQs. 
Um, it's just, it's just chaos. And look, I, I've said this many times to, to many national publications. I mean, it's, everybody had the best intentions on all sides. Okay. And I, and I don't fault anybody for that, but <laughs> you know, this, it was chaos. And we're going to be living with this for years, the fallout of all this, um, at least in my world. Um, because, you know, half a trillion dollars. I mean, the, th the thing that hasn't dropped yet, I've got a call with, with the national media tomorrow about some of this. Um, <laughs> the, the amount of fraud that this has attracted, it, it's just staggering. And that's a whole other discussion we can get into. But, but it, it was just very chaotic. People were fearful, Tim, as you said, for their lives because they don't know are they going to contract this or not. And we had to confront that right away and say, well, gee, are we going to come to the office or not? Uh, I'm fortunate in that about two thirds of my employees already worked from home all around the country anyway. But the other third, um, we had to make some big calls. And uh, I was very fortunate that you know, there was, the, there was this core group of us that, that came in every day. Now, we didn't go anywhere else, which was good because, you know, I don't think we, we could attract, you know, contract anything, but it was literally home to work, home to work, home to work for, you know, four straight months or something. Um, so all this is, I guess, the way I would answer it is your question about leadership about this is, you know, there's wartime leadership and there's peacetime leadership. And, um, and again, not to make light of, of, of military incursions and, and things that, that people have dealt with in the past. But, but I very much did feel like this was, you know, economic warfare and we were on the front lines and, and, and it's chaotic and hectic. And uh, I mean, and not everything went according to plan. And there was, because of the chaos of rolling these regulations out and, and what was unknown. I mean, there were times where, um, you know, I, I was like, you know, in the corner, practically sucking my thumb, you know, rocking and stuff. I mean, it was, it was bad. Um, and we had to, we, a lot of things had to go correctly. And I'm not a big believer in luck. I think it's maybe there's an aspect of it perhaps, but I do believe you, you do create your own luck. And uh, we just kept banging on things. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that, you know, I was, I was, <laughs> I was in my, uh, one of the, one of the few things I maintain my routine throughout all this is, is I try to still every morning get in my infrared sauna and read in my little half hour peace time. And I happen to be reading some, I'm not even sure how this happened, Tim. Maybe this is divine providence. I'm not sure. But I happen to be reading a very esoteric publication from the American Bankers Association relating to the Federal Reserve's discount window and how in times of crisis, they have, um, they've, they've authorized themselves to um, be engaged with uh, smaller lenders in, uh, in seasonal crises. I'm thinking like crop financing, right? So, you know, there's a big drought in the South and maybe, you know, you're a teeny little bank and they decide to lend you some money, um, something like that. But that was just enough of an opening for me to go, well, gee, that could apply to us. And I ran with it. And I told some people that I think this is the opening for a non-bank lender to participate in the Federal Reserve. And, and sure enough, the Federal Reserve released a, a notice and said that they were going to get around to allowing non-bank lenders. Of course, it took a painful three and a half weeks to actually get the regs out for that. But, but I, you know, and I've had, I've had some conversations with some folks in Washington and they're like, you know, if it weren't for you advocating for this, we're not so sure this might have happened. And, um, we were, and, and because of this, the first time the, federal, the U.S. Federal Reserve has ever allowed a non-depository institution to actually access capital from them. And um, if I told you how big my balance sheet is, you'd probably fall out of your chair right now. And it's mostly because I'm, I'm put on par with, with a bank um, in terms of my ability to access the Federal Reserve. So, um, you know, conspiracy theories aside about the Federal Reserve, I'm sure some people will think about that. But I mean, it was a it was a lifesaver for us in doing this, and it became a lifesaver for for our clients because without that, we wouldn't have been able to do some of this. And it was um, it was a, it was a massive yeah. effort, and it was very touch and go for a while there. So so let's fast forward a little bit. How I mean, we were talking about, if I recall, what, like eight to 12 weeks of just a frenzy? Is that about right? Yes. 
Yes. So, yes. so tell me, tell me how your, your organization, your staff, your team handle mm-hmm. it. I'm sure some handled it well, some didn't, and you probably have leaders in place. I know you're, I know the way you function, you probably have equipped some people. How did right. they handle that? And then the follow-up question, I'll go ahead and give you a glimpse into that is I'm going to, I want to hear the type people. I know you probably can't give specific on loans and things, but I really am going to start asking about some trends that you saw with businesses and where that goes. But okay. talk about your staff first, how they handled it. Well, the, um, the PPP program officially came online lo- April 3rd, and by April 14th, so not even two weeks, um, the first round was done. It was spoken for. And this was a bit of a, you may recall, this was a, I liken this to a bit of a land grab, right? So you remember, you know, back in the late 1800s going out wild west, um, you know, Stage coaches, they, they, you know, from the starting line, they go in Oklahoma and, you know, you put your stake in the ground or, you're, you know, you're out in Nevada or California, you put your stake in the ground and you own that, that mine or whatever. Um, it, it was a lot like that in that you had to get this all important loan number out of, out of the Small Business Administration. And because we're a big champion of their programs in regular times, we, we know how they operate and we played by the rules. And the problem is if you play by the rules, when the rules aren't fully laid out, you put yourself in a big disadvantage. And so it took us a little bit to sort of understand that this is, this is different. And um, this is a very different time. And, and we had to adjust some things. And um, in the middle of all this, by the way, the, the SBA in those, in those first 14 days, they approved more loans than they've done in the last 14 years or something. I mean, it was just, it was just insanity. The lending community has never seen anything like this and probably never will God willing. But um, it was, there was a lot, tons of media coverage, as you recall, uh, which just stoked more fear and more hysteria. Um, On April 3rd, we had over 4,200 inbound phone calls that day. We don't get 4,200 phone calls, Tim, in, you know, two years normally, right? I mean, it was insanity. It was so much. We, we used to, we, as, a, as a good business practice, we would record every incoming phone call and we say that we're going to do that for, for um, you know, training purposes and whatnot. We finally had to turn it off because it was becoming so expensive, all these inbound calls. And ultimately, we ended up hiring contractors for an outsourced call center to help us with this. Um, our staff was just deluged, just barraged with stuff. Um, to the point, I'd say more than half of my staff uh, broke down at some point in the first month um, because people were desperate. There was so much desperation on these things. Um, by, I was on just about every national news outlet I could ever imagine for, you know, from about mid-March until about mid-April. And then, frankly, I went on a media blackout because I had to do the work. Um, and I didn't have time. And I, there's a few times I actually even did. I, I'd, I'd never done this before, Tim. I had, I had press conferences where I had multiple national publications on Zoom, um, you know, reporters firing away questions. It was, uh, it was this bizarro world. Um, but, I, but, I, but I shut it down um, for a good probably eight weeks or so before I slowly came back to it. And, and now I'm, I'm back to it again, not, not to that extent, but um, because we had to do the work and, um, you know, my people, I, I'm, I'm really impressed because in times of crisis, I think it really brings out people's true character and, um, for good and for bad. And fortunately in my case, mostly I've got great character people, but I had a few people that, you know, they just, they couldn't handle it and I had to let them go. I mean, you know, they had, uh, almost that kind of, um, I don't want to call it analysis paralysis, but you know, there's that scene in Saving Private Ryan where, where the young uh, soldier is on the staircase and the Nazi walks back to him and past him. And he had the chance to, to kill the Nazi who was going to kill somebody. It actually did kill somebody. Um, and I'm probably butchering the scene a little bit, but he's so paralyzed by fear that he doesn't do anything. And the, and the Nazi walks right past him and later on, I think ends up killing him, if I'm not mistaken, or kills his, his superior or something. And there was a little bit of that. I mean, there was, there was just people, people deal with adversity in, in different ways. And it was very challenging as a leader to, um, to keep my team focused. I probably didn't communicate as much as I would have liked to um, because it was so much coming at me. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we, we did what we could 
And it was, it really was, like I said, it was, it felt like wartime leadership in, in many respects. And uh, it did cool off by, I would say by late June. Um, by that point, they had, uh, they had already extended the program and they added another, you know, 250 billion or 300 billion or something. And people kind of, they, they took a, they took a breath and they, and they, and there was some of that craziness that came out of it a little bit. And, and the rest of the program to the very end was, was pretty <laughs> comparatively was pretty normal, except for the fact that when you got closer to the deadlines and, and the first deadline was June 30th and they extended that to August 8th, as you got closer to the end of the two deadlines, um, the insanity of people trying to take advantage of the program, really to take advantage of, of US taxpayers ultimately, was just off the charts. It got to the point where we were almost like detectives, like you know sleuths, like uncovering some of these crazy, you know, forgeries and fraud attempts. And that, and again, we never signed up for this stuff. I mean, we did, but we didn't, not to that extent. And uh, I mean, I bet we've reported probably close to 500 people because there's a whole process to report them to the, the uh, Office of the Inspector General at, at the SBA. I mean, again, first time you hear from an FBI personnel, um, it's, it's really a little frightening. And even, we didn't do anything wrong, of course, but it just, you know, it's, it's that level of, of, of respect that you have for them or, or concern. Um, but again, by the time you're hearing from FBI folks every other day, it's, it's just old hat. Just old hat, yeah. yeah. You're buddies with the FBI. Well, I, I do want to ask something yeah. because something that I think what you're talking about there is just outright fraud because on yeah. the business side, this is kind of the follow-up question. And I'll share a, a client story that I've got mm -hmm. on the business side we were asking ourselves questions like, should we, shouldn't we, you know, in general, right. in general, right. some of our political beliefs are, you know, we're supposed to do this on our own. We, we're not supposed to reach out and grab when there's 300, 600, whatever hundred billion dollars out there. But we had to ask ourselves questions. What does the future look like? And, you know, right. one client in particular, uh, they did, they did get, uh, they did get the loan and they still have a good bit of that available. And I know for a fact that we would have made some decisions about people right. to release them if we didn't have that there. And yep. that's kind of what we saw a good bit. But, but we also, we couldn't project it when we were having to go through the process. I mean, and I'm sure no. a lot of people are like that. I mean, so what, what were you hearing from the business people? And I know it's a, it's a thousand different stories, or I don't know what metrics you can share with. It's probably eight or 9,000, I think, from y'all's standpoint. But, <laughs> but what were some trends? What were some things you were hearing on the other side of the phone? Well, I, look, I sympathize with what you're saying um, in your view, sort of your honor system, so to speak. Because, I mean, I've had, I've had a couple times in my life where I was unemployed for, for a little bit, and I, I've, never, I've never filed for unemployment because I felt like that's for people that are much more desperate situation than me. Um, and I don't, I don't want to partake in that. I don't, I don't want to possibly take from them, um, even so much so that when, what I think one time I even you know, tapped my 401k and paid the penalty and everything, which I think is silly that they even have that for those circumstances. But so I understand that what I would say, and I had this conversation with a number of people is look, um, at the end of the day, the, the federal government's telling you, you got to close up shop. The federal government's saying you can't take customers. The federal government's telling you, you have to stay home. You have to shelter in place. Um, nobody expected this. Nobody wants this. Um, but if it's the choice between your honor and you don't take the money and then you turn around and you lay people off um, and, and their livelihood suffers or you do it, um, I'd like to believe that, that you should participate in the stabilization of the economy because that's really what this was about. And so I, you know, I had that conversation with many people and I, and I, I think most po folks went ahead and did it. And I think that was the right thing to do. Um, I don't like the fact that it's as large as it is in terms of the dollar amount, but, um, and none of us knew how long this was going to go, as you said. I mean, I can remember back in mid to late March arguing with some of the folks on the small business committee saying, guys, you know, two and a half times monthly payroll. It's not, it's going to two and a half months. This could be with us a lot longer. Why don't we, why don't we, why don't we shoot big? Why don't we go big so we don't have to come back to the well again? Of course, that never seems to work with our form of government. 
um, even though it's rational and it's, it makes perfect sense. So I was arguing for, for four times monthly payroll. And unfortunately, they have to score these things. And, and the numbers were already scaring everybody because they were there's such massive dollar amounts. So ultimately, they did two and a half times. They ran out of money. They ended up doing more. And that's, that's where we get it. Now, there's still $135 billion left that was accounted for, that was, that was authorized, that has not been used, which is why I do think, Tim, that we're going to have another round of this. Uh, a second draw. There's going to be some stipulations in terms of, you know, you've had to have seen a revenue reduction of, of some percentage that you have to prove in order to get a second draw. But, um, you know, this is all about stabilizing the economy, because if you don't stabilize the economy, eventually people end up on the streets with, with pickets and, and torches. And that's, we don't want that, you know, and that's, yeah. that's what we're trying to prevent. So what is the uh, what is the forgiveness piece of this <laughs> looking like? And I'm, I might be asking you to look into a crystal ball now. No, and we're starting, okay. starting to look into, you know, where we are currently. We're recording this in fall of 2020. People right. might be listening to this well into 2021. But what do you have a feel for that? And, and what might that look like? Because mm -hmm. I, I get, uh, you know, when I have some of my calls with clients, we're trying to plan for that and we don't really know how to plan for it we are planning to pay it back you know that's what we're thinking yeah yeah a ambiguity sucks doesn't it i mean that's the problem with this whole program it's it's terrible and it, from my perspective i'm a banker at, at the end of the day you think you think i like uncertainty oh my goodness this has just been just brutal on so many levels um yeah i think uh i'm actually expecting from some of the folks that i'm talking to um, I'm not going to be surprised. Today is what the 8th of October. I'm not going to be surprised if next week uh, the SBA administrator, um, by a stroke of the pen, issues blanket forgiveness for for loan PPP loans that are less than fifty thousand um, dollars. I think she's got the authority to do that. I, I'm going to be shocked if she doesn't. And we'll see if somebody's watching this in January of next year. We'll see how good I am at predictions or, or my access. Um, I do still think there's going to be some legislative uh, tweaks that are going to allow that to go up. Um, it may, I think blanket forgiveness for $50,000 or, or down is just, that's just going to happen. Um, I think you may have a one page certification for 50,000 to maybe 150, um, which is, which is dramatically simplified versus what currently exists where the, you know, the government accounting office, uh, the GAO is estimating it'll take the average business owner 12 to 15 hours to go through the submission, the forgiveness submission process, which is far too long. Uh, it takes them away from doing their regular business that they should be doing. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to occur. Um, that would simplify things, not just for the, the business community, but also for the lending community and actually for SBA. Um, the intent of this program was for this to be, these are supposed to be government grants, basically. This is meant to be uh, money that you're using for for payroll, for your facility expenses, and for utilities. So um, that was the intent, and and I think simplifying forgiveness lives up to the spirit of the law. So I would expect that that's going to occur. But there's been certain industries, as you know, Tim, that have been you know really really hurt, and those are going to be the ones that'll probably get a, another bite at the apple with a, with a second draw PPP. Hopefully, again. It could be any day now. I mean, my, we're being whipsawed this week with the, the president wants to negotiate. He doesn't want to negotiate. Now he wants to negotiate again. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in D.C. right now. It doesn't help that it's an election year. Um, I think some of the political calculations are, were off and were misfired. Um, and people are scrambling. And I've been saying for two months, it's going to get rough in October. I've literally been telling these folks, right. if you don't come up with something by October, you're going to see large corporations as they go into the fourth quarter, they're going to be laying off people. You're going to see small business owners who their backs against a wall. At the end of the day, they're going to, again, human nature, you're going to save yourself first. They're going to start laying people off. Um, you're going to start to see more people filing unemployment. And, and that's exactly what we've seen now in the last 10 days or so. There's been, there's been massive um, negative economic news and, yeah. uh, and that's putting a lot of pressure on these folks. Will, and this is going to be an interesting question because we are 30 days or less out from our national election. 26. And, yeah, there you go. There and you many go. people will be listening to people have been voting now for a while. So, uh, and many people may hear this afterwards, but I just, I'm, I'm just curious, and this may be something you have thoughts on, maybe not, but does the outcome of the election 
what kind of impacts can we see if one party or the other party comes into power at the White House, the Senate? I think we know where the House is going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any just, and I mean, these are kind of generic answers. They're not really partisan. I mean, you mentioned that small business is a bipartisan issue, so I would hope that it wouldn't. Right. But you and I know that that's probably not the case. What might happen depending on which direction the election goes? Well, I, I don't think um, there's, I, I'm, my predictive powers are that I believe there's going to be additional monies available to the small business community. And I don't know that it matters which party secures the White House. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, frankly, it's, it's a function of, are we going to have, uh, the way I look at it, Tim, is are we going to have a great holiday season or are we going to have a strained holiday season? Because it's the actions they take now in early October that are going to have an impact on it. It's not going to do anything, I don't think, to the election. There's not going to be enough that you know, comes through uh, the funnel, economically speaking, to make an impact one way or another much for the election. And I think that's why we've had some of the stalemate we've had. But if we don't do something relatively soon, it's going to be make for a rough Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah season. I mean, it, that's just the reality. So, um, you know, the Senate is, is as always was it was originally created to be act as a buffer against the House, the passion, you know, the, the passions of the masses. Um, I think there's at least a 50 percent chance that the Senate uh, stays um, Republican. Um, as a buffer, as people are, you know, it's, it's, people have been doing this. I mean, I can remember my mother when I was in, when I was in high school asking her about how she was going to vote and, and, and her mother had told her that she, you should, this is just Midwestern logic. I don't know if it's right or not, but she, she said, you know, I always like to split the ticket. You know, is I, if I like the president, I'm going to vote for this opposite party in the, you know, in the house of the Senate and, and vice versa. And, you know, that does make for more dysfunctional government in general, as we can all appreciate. Um, but it also probably protects us some, you know, it forces compromise and it forces people to um, consider the other perspective. And so I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not, we are living in crazy times, Tim. I scratch my head sometimes with the behavior of either of the candidates that are running for the presidency right now and go, what? you sure that was a, a good move? I mean, I just, you know, I, I know who these, I'm voting for. These are, these are our best Why? choices. I mean, the question I ask is <laughs> this, out of all the 300 and something yeah. million people, this right. is what we got. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I know I know there's people in other countries that think that same thing. They're like, you know, America's got what, 330 million people and this is what they come up with? Uh, you know what? Nobody's ever said we're perfect. We're definitely yeah. not perfect. We got a long ways to go, but, but you know what? It's not a, it's not a great system, but I believe it's the best system that's been created thus far. And I like, um, I like the way you started off. You said, don't bet, don't bet against America. And that's kind of how I want us to begin wrapping up here because we're recording this tail end of 2020, which has been a brutal year. It, I think the podcast section might release early 2021. And kind of the last question I have before a couple of quick wrap up questions, Chris, is what advice can you give to someone who's listening that they've either had a good year or a tough year, 2020, they're heading into 2021 or it's already 2021. And you can either speak to them as a business owner in general, however you'd like to, but I'd love for you to give us just some I don't know, encouragement tips, uh, practical things. Just give us a few things from your experience. I mean, you've been, you've been voted top CEO, you, you know, in previous years and obviously weathered a storm with your business and you've seen a lot. Did, did I hear you guys did like 8,000 or 9,000 of these loans? What was that number? Can you give those metrics? Uh, 8,276. Okay, to be exact, 8,276. So, so you, you had to have seen that. You have to glean some wisdom from that. Share some of yeah. your wisdom with us before we wrap up with a couple of quick questions. Well, I think in challenging times like these, I mean, and this, this, is part of the, this, this is part of the solution, but it's part of the problem, which is um, you need to protect yourself. You need to protect um, you know, your livelihood, which oftentimes means you're going to have to make some tough decisions about expenses. You're going to need to conserve cash. 
um, when people do that, when they're, when they're less confident about things, um, obviously that has implications in other areas. You know, as you, you're not spending money. If you take this advice, then you're not going to be spending money maybe like you did in early 2020 or, or late 2019, for instance. And, and that slows down the economy and it just kind of is a, is a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, but I think nonetheless, I think people have to consider that. Um, in order to get through it so that they're well positioned on the other side. So I think, I think that's something that I would suggest. Um, you know, I think people need to look long and hard about if they, if they have multiple product lines or, or service lines, I think, you know, it's, it's, we, we get, we get fat and happy and comfortable and good times. And sometimes we do things that um, are not profitable for the business or are not, or not accretive to the business. I think it's, you got to make some tough decisions. Um, when I was a consultant, it, it, you know, there was never a client that I had um, where I couldn't find a, uh, a product line or service line that was not profitable that they needed to cut. And even though that overall reduced their gross revenue, um, oftentimes it would increase their net profits, which is, which is what the goal is. Okay. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, you know, it's, it's tough if you're a business owner, um, you have a very difficult position in that people are watching you and are counting on you and you may not want to be, you know, a ray of sunshine and, and confidence. Um, but by God, you got to put on that face and you got to do it sometimes. Um, and it's also okay occasionally it's a balance, right? It's, it's, you got to do that. But on the other, on the other hand, you also got to show your humanity sometimes and, and you got to show your emotion and you got to, you know, these things are affecting all of us. We're all going through this much like some of those other big monumental moments in our lives that we talked about earlier, Tim. Um, so I think it's, you know, I do still think uh, confidently that brighter days are ahead of us. I always believe that I, I am an eternal optimist in that regard. Um, but boy, I, I get cynical sometimes when I'm going through some of this stuff. There's no, there's no doubt. And I think it's okay to share that, you know, and, yeah. and um, telling people that you're, that you're scared and you're fearful too, but you got to keep going. Um, I think that's, I think that's important. Um, so I, that's, that's what I would say, Tim. That's good, man. You and me both. I try to be optimistic, but boy, at times I look at what's going on and think, wow, things could get rough. So anyway, man, thanks for that, Chris. I, I do. I forgot to ask, do you still have the barber shops? Do you still work with that? And how did they do through this? Are they around? Uh, yeah, they're still around. Yeah, I still have it. I'm, I'm just, just sort of a passive investor at this point. I own a piece of the franchise, the corporate. Um, I actually sold my, my I, I owned one of them. I'm, I'm a big believer in buying what I sell. So I actually owned and operated one of them for, for many years. Um, I started it literally as the last recession was starting. So that was brutal for a couple of years, but yeah, we, we, we grew it. It did very well. I ultimately sold to one of my employees, which was very gratifying in that regard. Um, but it was tough. Yeah. He, he's, he struggled a little bit um, at the big, at the breakout of this pandemic because you know, people weren't going into barbershops either, or, or even now when you go in, you, you have to wear a mask when you go in. And then when you sit in the chair, uh, there's a very smart virus, Tim. It knows not to attack you while you're in the chair. Um, which I find is fascinating. Just like on boats, I was in the Keys earlier this summer and I, and I just find, I saw the signs that, you know, you got to have your mask on anywhere you go, but the moment you get on the boat, you can take the mask off. I just said, wow, that's a, that's a smart virus. That's um, the I'm cynical, sure does it. That's the cynical yeah. coming out. It's kind of like, oh, and when, they play, foot, and when they play football, it magically doesn't be do fine. anything. <laughs> yeah, you'll that's be right. fine. And they go back to the locker room and then they're going to catch it. Yeah. yeah so it's I, like they, I, they congratulate. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot going on that is beyond, you know, yeah. how to think here, man. I, I would love right. to chat for longer, but we, we've got to jump off here, Chris. But I do okay. want to ask, how can people connect with you and give them whatever? We're going to include it in the notes, but I want people to hear it verbally. And especially sure. if they you know, have a desire for some of the things you provide with your company. But, but just if someone wants to reach out because you're fascinating and have so much wisdom, <laughs> how can people reach out to you? Well, thank you. Um, I try. Um, I mean, website is, uh, is fountainheadcc.com, fountainheadcc.com. Um, they can find me on all the social medias. It's either search for Fountainhead or search for my name, Chris Hearn, H-U-R-N. Um, you know, we're on everything, you know, YouTube channel, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Um, you know, you just Google me, you'll, you'll probably find 
you know, a bunch of really boring esoteric articles uh, where I cover more of this stuff and uh, small business financing. Um, but if I could help anybody, I'd, I'd love to, Tim, that'd be great. And, um, and there's more stories out there that we could tell some other time because we, we had, we had police patrols. We've been threatened through this whole thing. It's, uh, it's been some, uh, it's been some, you know, it's like that. I think it's a Chinese uh, saying that, uh, you know, may you live in interesting times. And we have definitely lived in interesting times this year. I think I, my theory is, is that maybe all of us were a little too comfortable in February. Yeah. And, and something just needed to shake us up. And now we're, <laughs> we're wondering, oh, my goodness, what have we gotten into? Because I think we're in for a season of uncomfortableness might be the best way of saying it, possibly. So. I just want to get to 2021. That's my goal at this point. So, well, just yeah. somebody posted this recently. You do realize you might be an old movie fan, but Mad Max, the original, was set in the year 2021. You know. Oh. <laughs> God, so we don't, got don't that put this for. on that. Don't put that on us, Tim. Come on, man. So, so I, I'm in my, I'm in the RV, Chris, and I can fire this baby up and go anywhere at any time. So anyway, <laughs> hey, um, the title is Seek, Go, Create. And three words there, Chris. The last question I'd like to ask is which one of those words resonates with you more and why as we finish here? Well, probably, um, I don't think seek does, but go is probably my initial reaction and, and somewhat I'm I, in and create as well, actually. But go is probably the one that stands out to me most. Um, why? Because I, I guess I'm a man of action and I think you got to, you know, if you if you want to make a difference, you got to be in motion to make a difference. So I think that's that's where I would that's what I would say. Yeah, that's so good, Chris. Thanks so much for sharing with, with me. I enjoyed the conversation and I know our listeners did too. Likewise. If you listen in and you want to continue the conversation, we encourage and welcome that. As I mentioned at the beginning, go to seekgocreate.com. That's seekgocreate.com. You could comment on this episode. You could, you could contact us. I'll even reach back. If you ask questions there, I'll even reach out to Chris and get him involved if it's a question maybe that he needs to answer. But we'd love to hear from you. If you go to the website, give us your best email address and you'll never miss an episode. You can also find us and communicate on Facebook. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and just recently released YouTube. All of those we are seek, go create. Until next time, be all that you were created to be. Mm -hmm.